Hello everyone. Um, today we are here talking about uh, searching for regional self-reliance and if that sets India apart. Uh, there's a lot to talk about in this um, conversation um, about India's ramping up technology and manufacturing capabilities, about talking about uh, admin input. And can the government and states maintain the right balance of taxes and ownership laws? Will India become the new but different manufacturing hub of Asia? Uh, what exactly India needs to do to reset it, itself apart? So we have with us Suman Bose, uh, principal and co-founder of Gopal Advisory and Investments, and he's based out of uh, Singapore. Uh, Suman, uh, do you want to? Uh, uh, okay, uh, and we have with us. Uh, exactly one more person, Komal Kalbar, who is the founder and chair um, uh, of uh, XI Pat India. So let's let's go to um, them to un understand what they do and what the work involves. Someone to you, if you can introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, thanks, Adhrija, for uh, taking the session forward. Uh, so I have been a corporate executive for about 30 years of my life. Uh, been, been and having worked uh, literally across all the habitable continents in the in the world, uh, and uh, my last stint was uh, in particularly in India, and it, that was actually the only stint. And I saw an India which is extremely uh, ready and and raring to go. So I think the topic has a lot of pertinence to what uh, my experience over the last decade has been uh, in and out working out of India. Uh, and I, uh, we, I started, uh, co-founded uh, Gofar uh, with a few of my uh, compatriots across the across the world over the last uh, three years. Our focus has been to uh, work with uh, what we call the next billion uh, people, which is just below the the top 350, 400 billion uh, affluence. Uh, affluent people across the world. We have to work with the next uh, 1 billion people and our goal is to bring in those products and solutions for those people which are primarily, you take India as the centerpiece of that uh, that, that that geographical map. Uh, India and, and, and we're also very, very big on Africa. We work on Southeast Asia, uh, Europe as a corridor, but India is quite a hard piece uh, sitting over there. So I think that's the pertinence of today's uh, conversation that I have uh, and, and the work that I do. I'm glad to be here. Thank you, Suman. Suman, over to you. Hi, hi. So, um, so I'm basically a serial entrepreneur. Um, I started my first business out of law college um, and uh, ramped it up, scaled it up um, internationally. We are uh, so my uh, so TT Consultants is an international innovation and IP consulting company. Uh, we have offices across Washington, D.C., San Francisco, Tokyo, Taiwan, Hyderabad, and Mohali is where our headquarters are. Um, and we work with most Fortune 500, 100 companies, including innovators of all scales to understand the innovation and kind of guide the R&D in the innovation strategy. Um, a couple of years ago, we realized that, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about AI, machine learning, NLP technologies, which were being applied initially in certain industries. But nobody was talking about how, um, you know, these systems and these technologies could be used uh, to augment and enhance the human ability to innovate. Um, and that's when we decided to, um, you know, uh, we, we got hold of all the world's uh, technology data. Uh, you know, we bought data from across the world, uh, which is pattern data, which, which is a great mirror of how innovation is happening across the world. Uh, we licensed in uh, all the world's research papers, publications, and over all that data, which is about a billion um, technology documents, we applied uh, NLP, ML technologies. And what that really enables companies, organizations, research institutes, you know, uh, colleges, universities to do is to get actionable intelligence out of that data um, and helps them to amend uh, the ability to be able to solve problems faster. We also apply a lot of uh, principles of scientific um, uh, invention, which have been proved across the world, which are which are similar to the TRIS principles. I'm sure some of you have heard of that. Therefore, uh, because we realized uh, uh, statistically and through our clients that, uh, that the R&D departments were spending so much time on reinventing the wheel, 
uh, most of the time of engineers was going into actually understanding data digging out data and then and then getting actionable intelligence uh, so uh, what we really want to do is to change the way world invents through data analytics um, and that can come from a very rich source of uh, uh, of innovation data so that's my new company called excel pad excel scout um and that's where we are trying to make a difference in terms of bringing in more efficiency uh, and cost saving for companies in research processes that is so interesting uh, so uh you know bringing it back to the conversation uh, that we were for and we are we are discussing uh india's success story or whether it is a success story so uh suman um what i want to know from it uh, from you is that uh being self reliant uh, you know uh, has been a conversation but what do you think self reliance actually means for india and what has been the india story so far or, or 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 do you think the india story will come out in the process of it becoming the manufacturing hub so uh, you know it's a uh, it's a very multidimensional topic and i would try to do justice in in a few uh, few ways first of all uh, you know self reliance in today's context is very different from what a self reliant would have been 50 or 70 years back when you pretty much controlled your entire supply chain end to end you know from the mine to the product or from the field to the plate uh, as far as agriculture is concerned or mine to the product as far as manufacturing this manufacturing is concerned etc but i think uh, those days are well past for every country uh, because the supply chain has whether we want it or not is is now global now for example the work that uh, komal does uh, could be using a product it could be building a product completely end to end in india but it might have ip ramifications somewhere else in the world or uh, an indian ip might be equally be used by products uh, people building products and building solutions and ip could be multiple ways you know process it could be uh, uh, design it could be the user experience etc and it's changing rapidly uh, second is uh, you know a country if if you take india and is uh, is not really a one homogeneous place of uh, middle income or high income or low income people you know it's a it's a massive demographic dividends uh, of uh, uh, young age uh, group uh, of different languages of different consumption habits etc so again for a country like india with so many so much of diversity creating uh, self reliance on every topic end to end uh, can be a very daunting ch- challenge if you don't understand what this self reliance is going to be all about last but not the least is of course certain sectors like for example defense uh, where india uh, and and given that we have a large landmass to protect Uh, and we are uh, amidst in whichever whichever way we are in the, in the indian ocean uh, as an indian ocean country or within our neighbors uh, there is a, a a very large demand uh, a latent demand or a potent demand of um, indian products and technologies uh, competing in the world stage and being used primarily by india last but not the least is the size of the market the consumption market that india is and that is extremely attractive for everybody in the world provided that demand is real and that demand is achievable and, and you can reach that demand and that uh, over there a lot of work over the last couple of decades has happened on the last mile reach the roads reaching the interiors of the villages distribution reaching in and today we have seen how distribution has penetrated even online deliveries and distributions have penetrated right into the into the furthest corners of the country now in this perspective Uh, i think when we look at self reliance my belief is in the world today and definitely for india for a large country like india uh it we have to we have to stratify the self reliance uh and and see whether golden thread goes through so the golden thread could possibly start at a at an innovation at a design at a at a user experience and take it right through the process of developing the product testing the product manufacturing the product uh, recycling the product uh because there is a there is a large uh, emphasis on the esg and the sdg footprints of a, of a product so so when you, when you take that golden thread i think india should and must uh focus on the golden thread and see where does india have natural advantage to add value and i think a couple of areas for example if india today tries to compete with low cost countries in in doing development i uh, in doing manufacturing uh i think it would be a very short term uh, uh, process and progress and we have seen that we have continuously seen how 
uh, you know, countries around us have upped their scale, whether it's in, in garment manufacturing of Bangladesh or whether it's of Vietnam or etc. So I think we are our key advantage as a, a big country is that given the diversity of our demand or a population, use the golden thread, focus on value additions around the golden thread. So that means we may do innovation, for example, of a certain product or user experience of a certain product, but we may not do the manufacturing, the core manufacturing part of it, the way we understand today of it end to end. So that's where, you know, uh, we would possibly be a part of the global product supply because again, one of the days when a, a company, any company would build a product, uh, only for a one specific market. They would do customizations for that market, but the product or the platform is typically built for a global usage. And India over there can play a large role. Industry 4.0 technologies, which again, India has an advantage, national advantage of technology. So I think we must play that handout of, of on Industry 4.0, and that's again, from right from the concept to build up the product. Uh, finally, a large market on environmental tech, on uh, how a product is used, how a product is, uh, uh, to be recycled, how a product is to be, uh, you know, uh, done an end of life, maintained, manufactured. All of that process, I think India would have a natural advantage if you can play up to that hand. And I think that would be the self-reliance. If tomorrow's, tomorrow India becomes a part of the fabric of the global product supply chain, where our products, where the products are designed to, to use and recycled, and India becomes an indelible part, multiple parts of that fabric, I think that would be a very, very self-reliant India, because then we are co-dependent on the global prospect. Also, we, 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 cannot be, we cannot be isolated from the global process at, at no points of time. And we have seen the countries which have done really well, whether it's uh, in the, in the, over the last couple of uh, decades or even maybe, maybe even further, are countries which have been able to become a part of the local lingo in terms of the fabric of uh, manufacturing or product building. I think that's the India's opportunity. And that's what we must focus on with the new India. This is uh, this is such an insightful thought that you know uh, self reliance, but self reliance in the right way, right? Optimization and not really trying to be self reliant everywhere. Uh, my my question to you, uh, uh, to the extent or uh, extension of this, is that do you think uh, often politics comes into play when it talks about self reliance? Then what I mean is that why do we then want to become self reliant everywhere when we know we don't have advantage in some places and we can take help from say a neighbor country right uh, who are perhaps doing a better job at it so you think that 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 is a challenge when it's true i mean absolutely because uh, whether it is a, a country politics or it's a corporate politics uh, people want to build empires and in, even in corporations uh, it's not easy for companies to start uh, insourcing outsourcing uh, because there is a lot of uh, challenge that happens. You know, what happens to my de department or division or those few hundred people or thousand people that I have in my department? Why should I give it up? You know, that essentially weakens my, and I'm talking as a corporate manager, weakens my political positioning in a, in a, in a company. Same thing happens in a company. Uh, you know, the constituents, so when you, when you try to maximize, you often, it's in the contravening of minimizing. On the contrary, on the other hand, if you see, for example, Despite talking about an open defense policy and an Indian defense policy to uh, to focus on allowing Indian manufacturers to build more defense products for us, uh, we have seen how little has happened over there. We are still primarily an import country, and where we have all the reasons, all the technology, all the all the people to build those those products in the country. So I think the policy. Whether it's a politics driving the policy or the policy driving the politics, I think it's both both ways true, is not in tandem to also create a market for those made, make in India products. Why will an Indian defense manufacturer or any Indian manufacturer go and build a product for Indian defense when they know that they will be not even given an even even keel, forget a, an, an, an additional space or additional leg up. They will not be even given an even keel to some of the global manufacturers. So therefore, uh, despite the last, uh, you know, uh, decades of Indian Indian government talking about uh, defense procurement policy, Indian Indian make in India, etc., very little has happened over there, and that's a sitting market, right, of hundreds of billions of dollars. Right. Thank you, sir. Um, Komal, uh, you know uh, what you started with about uh, AI and innovation. 
uh, and you're doing great work. Uh, what I wanted to understand from you that a how AI and innovation can help India become self-reliant because there is there is a lot that we don't talk about AI even now in this country, and there's no conversation around it. So, what is it that that can change? You think and make India self-reliant? Yeah. So, uh, thank you so much. So, so I think. Um, India and the world has changed tremendously pre-COVID and post-COVID, um, and our own Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi, has been speaking about an Atmanirbhar India, um, and the, and also the COVID has made us realize the dependence that we've had on global supply chains, as uh, my colleague was also right now mentioning, uh, and the over dependence on supply chains in some sectors. Um, and I think the way to really, uh, and again, our competition is the world, right? Whether it's manufacturing or it's the services sector, we have more and more competition. Uh, so, how do you make um, how do you make the industries more efficient? Uh, how do you make them more cost effective? How do you become more globally competitive, right? And here, I think the whole dialogue around the use of technology is very, very important. Um, and um, how do you use technology really to bring in efficiency, cost savings, make the industry more competitive? You know, uh, 4.0 industrial revolution, we'll soon be talking about 5.0. Um, I think one, um, there have been industries which have adapted AI, uh, you know, more than the other industries. For example, uh, during COVID, again, you've seen a lot of like data, uh, data analytics, machine learning, NLP around, even the development of uh, vaccines around the development of uh, drugs, um, you know, and uh, COVID has accelerated the the use and the adaption of these technologies. Um, I come from a state uh, of Punjab. I, I'm based out of Chandigarh, um, and I have seen some amazing, uh, amazing uh, technology startups who are looking at again applying these technologies to agriculture, for example. Um, how do you increase the agricultural produce by applying these technologies? Where uh, you know, you can kind of predict climate, weather, the growth of growth of crops. So even in agrarian states, um, use of technology has increased productivity. So you can look at any sector, whether it's pharma, biotech, it's agriculture. I think the technology is all there. And we produce and we are capable of. And if you look at the startup investments also in the last uh, year or so, there is such a such a rich climb, rich uh, ecosystem of startups in India. We've got the best engineering minds. We've got some of the best, uh, you know, universities, research institutes in the world. I think it's about how do you, how does the government also come together? The private sector always does enough. Uh, you know, as an organization, I'll do my best to develop uh, technologies. I will, I'll do my best to get the best people uh, in the room to work on problems which need to be solved. But how does the government also play a more enabling role, especially not just for businesses, but also for women led businesses? I think that's that's a place where, uh, you know, a lot of the policies and centers are lacking. Um, also, we must understand that countries, if you look at the data of countries who've done whose GDP has increased, who've done better o over a period of time, there's been a lot of stress on R&D. Uh, there's been a lot of stress on innovation and protecting that innovation. Uh, and I think I, I mean, working with a lot of companies on the IP and R&D strategy, both on the software side and the services side, we do see that some sectors now, especially where there's a lot of R&D investment, for example, pharma biotech, where there's a lot of um, uh, awareness about, um, you know, when you put in so much of hard work in R&D, you need to protect your innovations. You need to use that as a part of your business strategy. Um, and only if you're looking at scaling up across the world, if you're planning to become a country which is going to be self-reliant and export all these amazing products and services, if you're not IP protected again, you cannot scale up that product because somewhere or the other, you will be infringing other people's IP and that will bring up your scale uh, down. Um, and we've seen that, that companies, startups who have a strong IP in place as a centerpiece of their business strategy also get more investments, have more invested interest, the sector, sector. That becomes another incentive for companies to really... Uh, patent or trademark or copyright. Um, now, um, coming to my product, which is Uh this is what we've tried to do. We've tried to make the, the R&D uh, and the innovation processes easier for companies, right? Uh, we are sitting, you know, half of the world's data has been generated over the last five years. Um, and uh, the prediction says that about 50% of the world's inventions in the future will be data driven. 
so our endeavor as an organization or has also been to be able to put all the world's innovation data sets at one place um so that the information that um uh, that you know people need who are innovating that information is available at the click of a button and it's it, and the interface and the use of the the product is so simple that even a a, a novice innovator who has no knowledge of of ip who has no knowledge of um uh, you know using databases can access that information to solve problems faster to solve engineering issues um r&d problems and therefore help any organization or company to to scale up and solve problems faster and go to the market quicker so i think uh, india has to play a major role we've got uh, a great um, you know a technology workforce we've got a very very young population uh, which is tech enabled um, i think it's for the private sector and the government to come together uh, and scale this up uh, the 4.0 technologies in in a way that benefits us not just in the long term but in the short term and the medium run also and we become more globally competitive you know uh, thanks homal thank you for that uh, i you know when you said uh, i've been thinking about this you said that uh, we've got the best uh, engineers we've got the best minds in this country um, i wanted to understand from you and you said that government has a huge role to play but are if we are being able to keep these best minds in the country are we being able to uh, why are we not being able to do that do you, uh, yeah do you want to take that question you want to yeah i think i think because i mean for a i mean i've had an option of uh, moving out of india uh, and i've myself considered this multiple times right i have um, uh, i mean for me i can be in the us at any time i can be in canada uh, so i think um, everything is there right but as i said the government doesn't play um an enabling role for startups um and i feel like in india i sometimes feel i'm sorry to say that you have to work despite the government right so um for 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 a company like me that started with probably 5000 rupee investment is is what i started with i really feel like the journey that i have that i have made as an entrepreneur uh, has been my journey uh, in a very very private uh in a very personal capacity um and the government does promise a lot um but i think the ease of business the ease of regulations you know uh, creating an ecosystem where you're enabling businesses to grow uh that's still coming a lot from the uh, from organizations like probably tai and cii you have to really build your own network there to be able to enable businesses to come up so i think the government needs to strategize for example they need to strategize that okay fine ai is is going to be the future and how are you at every every point of the economy or at or in every state uh, your priority state cities how are you enabling that through incentives or schemes or other things i think that is lacking uh, still lacking in india visa vis maybe a singapore uh you know which really goes i mean i mean my colleague can speak about it i'm sure i mean if you compare the policies for startups you see a huge difference in uh how india takes it and how singapore takes it suman so, uh, do you want to continue on that do you feel that india doesn't provide uh, the space to grow and though we have the best minds is it something what is it so uh you know let let me take that from a uh that point that you know india uh, indian and entrepreneurs grow in india despite of the government or in spite of the government i think there's a lot of resonance in that uh, there is a there is a lag massive lag of uh, most most importantly policy and policy implementation uh, you know i i just spoke about for example we have been talking about self reliance we're talking about make in india but the policy implementation of that from even for the government to today for example most large companies if you see when they're government companies this is the government companies who still procures uh, the, you know significant amount in india 30 35% 40% of capital procurement happens by government or government companies uh, no indian company no indian startup can ever compete because uh, the way the the technical qualifications or the process qualifications are, are written out uh, there's no way so the only way you can you can be part of that is if you are a global major or if you are and 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 who's writing those uh, specifications it is our people who are writing those specifications contrary to what the policy document says policy document for example says you know incentives to startups policy document talks about you know and, and for example if tomorrow 
uh, Komal's company wants to go and bid for a, a, a national level AI uh, project, uh, very little chance that she will be uh, she will be selected on the head of uh, some of the global maps. Although she might be equally competent, if not more competent. So that's a big problem of implementation of policies. Second is second problem is uh, you know the demand again. In, I'm, I'm going back to demand. If you have a demand, you will find your supply. Uh, the problem in India has been that demand has been very fractured, and very little has been done to bring that demand together. For example, supply chain. Let's look at some manufacturing. One of the core area of manufacturing is supply chain, inward as well as outward. India is possibly the world's most expensive supply chain, 16 to 18 percent of our GDP supply chain. Whereas the worldwide, the cost, the price, the, not GDP, the, the of the cost is supply chain. Whereas worldwide, that number is between three to five percent. Now, no way, even if an Indian company becomes super competitive in its manufacturing process, product design process, will it still be able to compete to reach the product to its customer's hand? at a price which is uh, comparable with uh, what a global major could do. So innovation in supply chain. Innovation in supply chain needs innovation in fintech because supply chain is not just material. It's also payment. Innovation in fintech. Innovation in, uh, in and, and that innovation in fintech, for example, we have seen how uh, there are there are large monopolies being now being suddenly being created. So so this is, the, the again, the challenge of this country, in, in my view, is it's, it is it is a forever a land of opportunity, but somebody has to be able to fructify that opportunity. And I think there is no better way than by uh, obviously there is a there is a demand side or a supply side push. Sorry, not demand side, supply side push of Indian startups uh, vying globally, trying to be globally competitive and therefore locally relevant, uh, being a, being a part of that. And in fact, most many Indian companies startups find it easier to do business abroad than to do business in India. And, and they're very well accepted as, as Indian startups, especially tech startups, very well in, uh, very well accepted. Uh, this is something which, if, if there is a state, and I know, I know there's a healthy competition that can happen within our states, but if states also feel like that they will be able to create incentives for uh, you know local startups to do better in, in within their own states, uh, there are so much so much areas of uh, of, of uh, encouragement work, fin funding, financing that can happen. And uh, that's uh, fortunately some of the states are doing better. And, and some of the states rise out as shining examples uh, and some don't. Uh, so uh, I, th I think we might see uh, a, a disparate therefore, and, and, and there's no, no reason why a startup which might have been started uh, in one state will not move its base to another state if it feels much more welcome in another state. So I think, I think in India over the next few years, might see a disparate kind of a growth of startups in the country based on how the states will be incentivizing their own consumption of the products that these startups build or creating enabling uh, legal and uh, policy frameworks implementation of those policies uh, for an advantage of the startups thank you Simon. uh just to do a wrap uh, we've been talking about uh, searching for regional self-reliance. We've discussed uh, what is self-reliance for India, whether it should become self-reliant in everywhere. Uh, we, we've talked about the best minds in the country and what, uh, why is it so difficult to do uh, business in India? Why is it easier outside? And the one uh, one thing that I think Indian entrepreneurs grow your development is the, one of the key takeaways from this conversation that we are having right now. Um, so, you know, uh, extending that, uh, um, Komal, uh, back to you. Uh, let's talk about, you know, you mentioned early at the beginning that uh, it's also what's the future for India, right? Like taking this away a little bit ahead and uh, what, what does it mean that more women more uh, um, women entrepreneurs, more women in tech. And that's something that I'm always interested to know that is that the future and is that a better future? Yeah, definitely. You know, like we are a, a, a major uh, a part of the population, right? Uh, uh, and we are half the population uh, in India. Um, and But we are such few of us um, who enter te the technology field and then more than entering the technology field, we stay in the technology field. Um, and then we go up in the technology field in leadership positions. 
um and i think it's not just um, data in india if you look at the global data also we we form a very very small fraction of um uh, the population where uh, we are able to really really get into technology um, technology work if you look at um, tech of course you know with hyper digitalization post covid this is an industry which was already growing but it's growing at an exponential uh, rate right now because um uh, the tech is being applied in almost every industry now um and there's going to be a huge spur in demand for this technology it's the fastest growing industry in the world it's one of the highest paid um you know it's going to it, it's expected that it will have two times more jobs in this sector than any other sector um i was looking at data in the us in the next two years 1.5 million jobs are going to be created and therefore opportunities are immense um and obviously to to kind of uh, deliver on these opportunities we would require a pipeline of uh, technologists engineers and if you look at india india has one of the highest number of of women engineers in the world i mean we produce 30% of engineers uh, in india uh, which are women right um and therefore how do you leverage uh, this this talent right now which is which is the need of the hour and is going to be the future of in the world and in india um and i do a i do a fair bit of um a work again in my in my personal capacity for example 30 uh, 50% of the women in my workforce um are are engineers data scientists machine learning experts um and there's a lot of enabling environment and policies that we have to create to be able to retain them and take them to leadership positions and these are not major interventions these are very these you have to understand where is it that you think you're going to lose the pipeline what are the supporting policies that you need and i mean the best uh, performers in my team right now are women um, in tech so again in the private uh, capacity i i've kind of understood how you how you get them in how do you retain them and how do you leverage their talent um i've also adopted certain certain itis uh, across india where we give them um, you know very very nice short term courses in um, in vocational reskilling uh, in technology um, and we see that there's almost a, a 80 to 90% placement that they have because the the demand is there so again coming back to the government role right i mean in in my private capacity i could probably adapt uh, adopt 200 300 students uh, women students to give them this kind of a leverage but again if the government can strategize and say okay fine for a state as you correctly said my colleague that you can also like look at priority states where where do you have more engineering or 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 technical talent and then how does the government play a role in in making sure that that becomes a part of their strategy uh, on vocational training reskilling uh, you know skill development organizations collaboration bringing that talent Uh, uh in the market incentivizing private companies and government organizations to take in those women um you know and then kind of like create uh, a more gender balance in technology um and i think you know we've kind of in a lot of industries and a lot of uh, uh, economies we've just not been able to leverage women and bring them up to uh, to leadership positions and i think this is going to be a golden opportunity for women because this is in any case going to be a very highly paid sector so if we have to bridge the gender gap the gender gap right now i think this is a great opportunity for governments uh, and the private sector to take up and do their bit right thanks komal that was insightful so uh, the one thing that i'm learning is that we uh, we have the best minds and we have uh, great talent and uh, but somehow and private sectors are playing a role in um, keeping those talent here but the government is not being able to do uh through its policies and um even even with the case of women and when it comes to uh retaining them and leveraging them. uh suman do you do we want to uh, you know i wanted to take that conversation that we were having at the beginning of this uh, about um about india's growth story and what do you think that other countries you are in singapore right now and what is it uh, that that other countries are doing other south asian countries are doing or asian countries are doing that india is uh, india needs to learn from them what what notes to india need to do so uh foremost i think the and, and this is not rocket science you know every company every organization knows uh, big or small that you know plans are as good as they are implemented uh policies are as good as they are implemented uh 
most countries which have done uh, very well in the uh, in the recent past or even even before that have taken sectors and implemented policies implemented their strategy uh, for example if you look at uh, vietnam uh, which is a which is a great story and one of the possibly the one of the strongest story that is emerging uh, or you take a very large country like for example look at the res- resurgence of france i mean uh, france in the last few years have become the the most attractive investment destination in in europe ahead of uh, germany who thought who thought two decades back and i I've, i've worked and lived and worked in france uh, who thought france would be would be so competitive uh, so so i think it's a question of deciding priorities deciding sectors and then implementing it that is where something which there is a leaf in learning for india and those implementation a lot of the implementation has to be driven by uh, people who are competent to drive those implementation uh, people who are subject matter experts for those in, uh, for those stuff for example i may be extremely passionate about say medical science but i am not competent to be the person in the driving seat for that so only a passion only a direction doesn't make sense there have to be people there have to be technocrats there have to be people com- competent to drive those uh, actions number 2 if you see if you see south southeast asia asia being a center of consumption has already happened over the last 10 15 20 years in fact right now uh, india's demographic dividend uh, is there but it will not be there forever you know we are also getting getting older our our middle middle bulge is going to happen uh, our number of people who will be on the side of being retired or semi retired or out of the workforce on being an older age is soon going to be exceeding the ones uh which are there in the workforce so again looking at the priorities for example if you look at africa which is a very emerging market in terms of for most countries in south east southeast asia uh creating beaches in africa india always have had a very strong relationship turning into centuries with africa now are we exploiting enough are our startup exploiting enough to get into the african markets because in my belief that's the market for the future that's the mar- in the next two or three decades that's the biggest market uh, in terms of new consumption in terms of new production uh, i i don't see in the startup lingo in india rarely i have seen any company which even is thinking about africa so so i think indian it, it's all stuff therefore it's not just a question of the government and i think this is a is a is the balance that other southeast asian nations are doing well because when i see vietnam for example despite being a large you know vietnamese coffee if you see today suddenly a global brand but a lot of the vietnamese coffee are actually in sourced out of africa so the way vietnam is making beach beach heads in terms of their insourcing and outsourcing and ban- managing that balance despite being such a small country in terms of size and population uh is uh, a recipe of what i think india can learn and any any most countries can learn i'm just taking vietnam as an example i have many other examples i mean we saw thailand in the last uh, 30 years what thailand did to its own economy uh how so, they became a nation south east india in terms of per capita income too so i know that's another thing yeah uh, absolutely so i think i think you know it's it's setting priorities and implementing the policies it is not about talking about the policies you know it's sometimes you know you have to Uh, you know do less to do more and i think we are trying to uh, put our put our talks and discussions in every piece of the cookie jar but not being able to fill up those cookie jars with the right cookies right that would be analogy um anything else you want to add to that kumar please just wrap up in a good way yeah no i think uh, i've recently experienced you know we were part of a very big um government tender this is the first time i i applied for a government tender in india uh, and this was really about it, it was a huge implementation and we competed with companies with large companies global companies uh with the likes of ibm um you know and we were successful in getting the tender because i mean our technologies were proved to be the best in terms of expediting the um the grant rate of patents in india which could have had a huge impact on on the speed at which patents get granted in india and therefore you know in, in getting more investor interest in in india um but again like you know we got stuck in a useless litigation uh you know which came from one of our uh, one of our competitors so i think again uh, as he correctly said you know that it's one is to have the policies in place and the second is to implement them right and implement them in a way where you 
uh, where the startups feel, where you know, newer newer age companies feel confident uh, that if they are spending time and resources on developing something and they're part of a process, right? They they kind of get recognized for it, um, and there is a there is a decent ROI on it. I think prioritization is very important. Of course, I think um, startups are very driven. They're very passionate about their ideas. Uh, I think a lot of them either run out of funding or they run out of uh, uh, you know support. Um, so I think this is going to be a very very important thing for uh, uh, for India for the government uh, to ensure that at least some states, for example, I, I totally agree, uh, are more um, uh, investor friendly. Uh, I've, I've, if you go into a, a Telangana or you go into these um, uh, other states, or even into a Karnataka, I, I mean, they'll still roll out a red carpet for for startups, whereas some states just don't do enough in terms of policy. Um, and I do think that uh, for me, I'm very passionate about women in technology. I think it's a it's a it's going to be a, a great opportunity for women to enter the technology space. Uh, and I think all of us um, can do can have inclusive policies. Uh, within our workplaces, um, uh, you know, and and promote this uh, in a very very big way. Um, and the gig economy, you know, has made it easier for women to enter the workplace right now with flexible hours. Um, you know, it's so much easier for them to have uh, more options in terms of working. And I think this is going to be again a very big story for India if we can ride the technology wave and if we can have more women inclusive uh, in the technology space. And what the government will do to help all of us? <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Suman. Anything that you want to end with this with? No, I echo the part on the women in technology. I think that's a uh, uh, that's a that's a global need uh, because uh, uh, if the world's fifty percent of the uh, products are consumed by by women, why are the less than twenty percent of the products been built by women? So I think women in tech is a very important. Uh, and India can play a very important role over there too, because that's that could be a differentiation for India. Right. I thought you had. I don't know. Somebody wants to speak, I suppose. Yeah. There's someone who wants the mic. Okay. okay. There's a request. Yeah. the Sharma. I've just accepted it. It says he's getting there. So okay, I'm not too sure. Maybe he press it next day. Um, okay. Uh, um, thank you for this uh, really lovely, insightful conversation. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Komal. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thank all you. of you. Thanks, Adriya. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.